Welcome to the Steve Noble Podcast. Tons of truth, lots of grace, but no sacred cows. Now, let the show begin. The first time uh, Preston Sprinkle was on the show when it was the radio show, a very important topic and a very important book uh, embodied, which really dealt with the whole issue of transgenderism, which we're all dealing with that in one way or another. Like, for example, when I asked my students, all my in-person students, how many of you know somebody personally in the LGBTQ arena? And these are all high school age, homeschool, conservative family kids. And it's usually 75, 80% of them who know somebody personally. A lot of them know somebody in the transgender world, uh, which is why that was such an important book uh, that Preston wrote. And we had him on to talk about that. This is, again, one of those books that I highlight the tar out of it because there's so much there. And that was incredible. And then I saw a buddy on Facebook that was reading an advanced copy of Preston's brand new book, which just became available. Uh, new York Times bestselling author Preston Sprinkle, Exiles, the Church in the Shadow of Empire. And I'm always working with and have for years on the radio and as a Christian activist and spent a lot of time, maybe too much time in politics. And, and with all the teaching, I'm always wrestling with what does it look like to live out your faith in the confines of whatever country you are in, in this particular case, America. And as somebody that uh, was very involved in a cheerleader in the culture wars, I got the T-shirt, the whole nine yards. But most people that know me, at least here locally, will tell you Steve Noble is not the guy he used to be. And uh, the Lord did some things uh, through Pastor Greg Laurie and working on Harvest Crusades and evangelism stuff. And so I was immediately attracted to the book. So we're going to talk about it with Preston here today uh, on the Steve Noble podcast. But let me throw our favorite little intro in and then we'll get going. Welcome to the Steve Noble podcast. Tons of truth, lots of grace, but no sacred cows. Now let the show begin. All right, Preston, great to have you back. Uh, where, are you in California? Where are you? I'm in Boise, Idaho. I, I'm from oh. California, but I've been here about 10 years. <clears throat> so uh, I, you heard me mention Greg Laurie and the Harvest Crusades. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, his right-hand guy retired and moved to Boise, a guy named John Collins. Oh. So I'll have to connect you. <laughs> John, yeah. John got yeah. saved in the Jesus movement and has been around Greg and the Harvest Ministries huh. for like 40-plus years. You'd wow. love that guy. I go but to Boise Calvary looks, Chapel in Boise, so he, yep. maybe he he might even go there. I don't know. Yeah, there's a good chance that's where he's at. So <laughs> yeah. that's cool. I'll, I'll connect you guys. It's great to have you on. Thank you so much. Uh, so, yeah, let's dive into Exiles. This is really an important book, which is why I got it as quickly as I could and read it as quickly as I could. And I've got multiple different color highlighters, so I can't <laughs> loan this book to anybody. Uh, but but what kind of motivated you to get into this one? Because it's not like we're in a, a yeah. really peaceful political environment. This is a contentious <laughs> issue. I know because I've been up like, for example, you don't know this, but for the last six years, the most grief I've gotten from listeners and people on the podcast, whatever, are from Trump supporters. And I've, mm. I voted for the guy twice, but I, I, I have no allegiance to man. And mm. so this is a, this is a touchy subject, which is one of the reasons I was like, oh, this will be interesting. See how much trouble Preston gets into here. Uh, <laughs> but what motivated, especially yeah. now, I mean, we're in such a, a crazy uh, era of politics, but what kind of brought you to the yeah. point where you're like, I got to write this? Yeah. I mean, it's, I've been using the phrase exile in Babylon Quite, kind of frequently um, in, in talks I give on social media and stuff and just how I even kind of approach political conversations. Um, I try to approach them like as if, you know, a, as the Jewish exiles would have approached Babylonian politics, as the early Christians would have approached, you know, Roman politics in the first century with what I would consider a healthy theological distance not separation, isolation, isolation, don't be involved. Don't, you know, like, I, I think that absolutely we need to seek the good of the city. Um, we need to embody kingdom values in the world. We need to do good and, you know, pursue justice. And, um, but I think it, we should do so from a healthy distance, like uh, with, with a healthy understanding of the separation of church and state, which we all, we all agree with, but I think right. the church can so often get sucked into the, <laughs> the state in, in, in ways mm -hmm. that can be, uh, that can be damaging for the church's witness. So I grew up um, like most Christians, you know, in, in a very kind of Republican only conservative environment. And uh, I began to see, it just seems like people's political values were more important than their Christian values, or they just simply conflated 
Republican values with Christian values. Yeah. And and as I started studying the Bible and, and started to grow and learn and kind of as I started to kind of examine these values, sometimes it, it, it these conservative values made sense, you know, like pro-life, I think, is a very easy one to, to get on board with scripturally. Um, uh, but then there was other ones, you know, I might say, I, I don't know about this or that talking point from this political pundit. Is that really biblical? Like, I don't know if I, yeah, I don't know if yeah. Jesus would really be on board with that. So I began to just see just just this unhealthy allegiance to a political party. <clears throat> And how that kind of can get in the way of your faith. And then, so I did, I kind of peeked into kind of more like left-wing Christianity. And I saw kind of the same thing. Just, you know, um, I think fundamentalism is, is the same thing, whether it's on the far right, far right, left, you know? Right. And so anyway, so I just, for the last 10 years or so, I've been tr trying to cultivate a, pers a bib more biblical perspective of, you know, how did the people of God view themselves in light of the nations and empires they were right, like, living right. under? And so this book basically is me, me finally kind of putting my thoughts down in a book length form to kind of tease, tease that out. So yeah, that's a long answer to your short question. No, no. I mean, that, I mean it, that, and, and you, you mentioned journey, the word journey, and that's exactly what I've been on. I mean, in 2004, I became a Christian activist and we live in a target rich environment. If you want to go into that world, and, and as a, as a culture warrior, I mean, it's stuff everywhere all the time, 24 seven. So it's not like there's any lack of things to do, but, but I did notice what happened to me. My kids noticed what happened to me. Uh, one of the challenges, at least for me personally, I'm not going to lay this on everybody, but I think it's pretty common, uh, is that the culture war tends to breed self-righteousness and mm. self-righteousness is addictive, uh, especially, yeah. and, and then it kills sanctification because I'm always comparing myself to the worst elements of culture in our society. So I feel like a pretty good person as a Christian. And then it also in me, and I think in a lot of people, it kills evangelism. I think God's more interested in seeing Americans saved than saving America. Hmm. And, 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 it, and, and it's really deceiving. And, and there's some good things in there, seeking the welfare of the city, as you mentioned, and with Jeremiah and, and being a watchman on the wall. And there's so many different things mm -hmm. we can apply. Uh, but at some point, like you, Preston, I started to question, uh, you know, what is my allegiance? I, I want to talk to you about the Pledge of Allegiance because you and I are both in a, in a similar position there. Okay. okay. And then it was just a few years ago with a guy on, on one of the guys on my board when I said, yeah, you know what? I used to describe myself as a Christian American and I don't anymore. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a Christian who by God's grace was born and, and raised and still lives in America. But my first allegiance isn't to America, it's to Christ. And, and so this, this process, uh, which I think a lot of people don't even stop to consider uh, when you place your hand on your heart and you pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, if maybe your allegiance is somewhat misplaced, or at least you're conflating the two, as you said, uh, this was uh, like the whole God and country thing. I'm, I'm pretty early in the book. Uh, one of the goals of this book is to show that the dual allegiance God and country view runs counter to how God's people viewed themselves throughout scripture. And, and, th and you mentioned that Preston, that's an important point. That's going to be our benchmark here. A scripture, not, the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution, which I both know well. The Jews living under Babylonian or Persian rule or Christians living under Roman rule would find our undiluted patriotism quite odd. Instead of a God and country lens, I want to cultivate an exilic lens, one where we see ourselves as exiles taking up temporary residence in a modern day Babylon. Well, why is it so important to wrestle with this whole God and country thing, Preston, versus mm -hmm. this notion of and the reality that we're actually exiles here? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That, that is kind of a, a foundational launching point in the book. And and I think the rest of the book kind of hopefully adds some biblical backing to that. You know, I don't think it's hard to show scripturally. I mean, it's right there in First Peter 1.1 1, 1, when Peter writes to, you know, people who are like citizens of Rome and they're living yep. in Pontus and Galatia. But he says, you've been scattered abroad as exiles in Pontus and Galatia and, and Cappadocia and Asia. And I just, I, I think that's a very biblical perspective, but I think if if I think I get funny looks if I apply that very biblical language to today, like yeah, I've, I you know I'm I'm been scattered, we've been scattered abroad, and and there's brothers and sisters who got scattered over in Sudan and Nigeria and Canada and New Zealand and and the United States, and you know I've been scattered in a land now called Idaho. You know, um, <laughs> it used to be the land of the you know Shoshone natives yeah. until the pioneers kicked them out, and now you know it is what it is, and that's the situation I find myself in, but. Um, I'm I'm primarily a member of Christ's global kingdom, and that's my allegiance is to that king and right. the citizens of that kingdom. Um, 
and I just happen to be scattered abroad in America. Now, I, now I'm in America, and so I should seek to go to the city, submit to my governing authorities, and and my Chinese brothers and sisters should do the same. Um, what's interesting about even that, so the dual allegiance, like if we widen our lens a little bit, like if, if we had some Chinese brothers and sisters and, and, and the Chinese church <laughs> is just killing it yeah, in China. Exploding. Killing yep. it. Um, if, if, the, if the Chinese, if our Chinese brothers and sisters says, you know what, we are, we are really nervous about giving our allegiance to China. We, we're not going to pledge our allegiance to China. We're going to be good citizens here, but our primary identity is in the global kingdom, not, not mm -hmm. in not being, you know, living in China, we would have no problem with that as America. We'd be like, oh, go for good for you, you know. <laughs> but for right. some reason, we think our situation is different. Why? Wow, we're the good guys and they're the bad. You know, we have this kind of like, kind of, I think, warp maybe yeah. view of of America. And I, let, let me just, one more caveat. Um, I, 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 I say in the book, I love America. I love mm -hmm. the culture. I think, you know, I think democracy is a good thing. Um, I think there's a lot of things good about the American project. Um, so I'm not, I don't want to say like, it's just pure evil, but neither was right. the Roman empire. The Roman empire, you know, built the whole system of robes. They kept oh. thieves at bay. They outlawed adultery. Like there were some good things they did, but at the end of the day, the Christians still said that is a different kingdom. We mm -hmm. belong to a global kingdom and we're going to be good citizens towards Rome, but we are going to be, really suspicious about getting too chummy yeah. chummy with with the empire so well you have to realize what it is which we'll get to because you brought that up out of the book of revelation that you go and this is where a lot of christians in america struggle and since, since you brought up china yeah it's like if if our chinese brothers and sisters said hey do you want to join us in pledging allegiance to the chinese flag we'd be like what are you nuts you live in a communist country run by a yeah. dictator who's a tyrant who's killing uyghurs and all the other people and the one yeah. child policy which is now two and they've whack so many children in the womb how can you possibly yeah. pledge so so we look at china as this inherently evil nation and i would say it is and and we look at america as if it's not yeah. uh, because we we when you study american history there's no denying the impact of a christian worldview a christian perspective sure. a certain degree of knowledge of the scriptures our founding fathers are a squirrely bunch of people who I don't think most of them, based on all my study in all these years, would mm. qualify as born again evangelical mm. Christians. Yet their uh, their admiration of and use of Scripture from a moral standpoint, a moral philosophical standpoint, and how do you design a government, including looking at world history, uh, was phenomenal and way way deeper than probably most Christians in America today. So we tend to look at America mm -hmm. like it's uh, God's chosen people 2.0 because of our founding being influenced by Christianity. And so we, we that's one of the things I want to talk about is we look at America as if it's uh, the most pure on the planet relative to scripture or a Christian perspective. Yet that's not true uh, <laughs> comparatively, but that's like me comparing myself to Hitler. I'm going to look pretty good, uh, yeah. <laughs> but comparing myself to the Lord, <laughs> good luck with that. So yeah. I think, I, I think that's really important that we understand the essence of government, and that's why it's so important in your book. Uh, we're talking about exiles, the church in the shadow of empire. They have to lay down the theological basis for this. You love your country and care about your country, but it's not your country. Right. Right? We're from yeah. another kingdom, I seem to recall. Yeah. Yeah, one thing I do in the book, I, I love it. Yeah, everything you said. There, you know, every, every nation is gonna, probably going to have a blend of good and evil. Some are worse mm -hmm. than others. And I think on the spectrum of secular nations trying to run the world or rule their slice of the world america is you know but better than i think probably most but but there isn't there yeah, like you, i mean if you peek behind the curtain a little bit you, you do see an underbelly i mm -hmm. mean not only is you know the united oh. states built on the back of slaves okay that's obvious and, and you know a lot of countries were so it's not like we were unique in that no um, we were like just so you know we were number nine out of the top 10 countries in the north atlantic slave trade not number oh, okay. one. Yeah, Portugal yeah. was number one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And that and, and that doesn't. Gosh, I didn't. I didn't. No. I mean, people will like act like America is the <laughs> epicenter of chattel yeah, slavery, yeah. but right, chattel right, right, slavery right. is a is a sin problem, and it's been around since we got right. kicked out of the garden for the most part. It doesn't excuse it. It just means America no. wasn't unique in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Colonialism. We we pillaged and rape the riches of many other countries and you know and, and now we recognize gosh that probably wasn't good and and a lot of people were doing that a lot of uh, european nations sure. were doing that so again we're not unique in that but like mm -mm. you know we've got a, 
a checkered history. Um, but even in yeah. the last hundred years or so, we've been involved. The United States either overtly or covertly has been involved in overthrowing democratically elected leaders in 60 different countries, 80, yeah. according to some estimates. I mean, what we did in Iran in 53, Guatemala in 54. If you oh, yep. do some research there, it is hor- the United Fruit Company in, in we were going to lose money and we went in and overthrew a democratically elected leader who's watching out for his people. I mean, just and over and over and over Ukraine, yeah. 2014, 2004, Biden was involved with that. And there's just, hey, they, hey, we the used curtain. the U.S. military to go in and collect <laughs> debts for people in the Caribbean. I mean, yeah. <laughs> or what happened in Hawaii. And that's where, that's why we all know what Dole is and they just go over and take yeah, over totally. these yeah, areas. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and so, and so I, on the other hand, I just talked to my buddy who uh, lived in Uganda for 10 years, and he says the United States gives almost half a billion dollars a year to mm-hmm. uh, to provide free uh, medicine for HIV-positive people. So now if you're HIV-positive in Uganda, you can go get free medicine that basically – makes it where you can live a flourishing life. Yeah. So, so I just, I, I, when I point out maybe some of the underbelly of the American mm-hmm. empire, um, I'm not saying it's all bad. I'm just saying like, let's not believe all the press too. Let, let's not think that right. we're the clear good guys. Everybody else is the bad guys. You know, it's like, we, we all have a blend of good and evil. Mm-hmm. And I, the, the, I mean, the government propaganda is very good at their job. Okay. For many governments. So let's sure. Let's I, not, mean, uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, like with students all the time, I'm like, do you guys, especially in U.S. history, and but world history and, and civics as well, I'm like, do you guys think I hate America? No. Hmm. Would you call me a patriot? Yeah. Hmm. But is there something different about the way I approach this? Because uh, I ask them all at the end of the year, how, how has your perspective on America changed? Hmm. I'm not at... I don't believe you should hate America. No. Uh, I, I could make a, a pretty strong case historically that America is one of the greater nations in the history of the world in terms yeah. of our impact on the world. But but you've got another yeah. side of that ledger, just like you, Preston, just like me. There's things that are honorable and beautiful and amazing mm-hmm. and well done, good and faithful servant. And there's other things that since we were talking about this sphere earlier <laughs> in Las Vegas <laughs> in the YouTube concert, there's a lot of parts of my life I do not want up on a 160,000 square foot screen. <laughs> and both things are true at the same time. Yeah. There's things about Steve Noble that are really bad. Mm-hmm. And there's things about Steve Noble that yeah. are really good where I'm in line with scripture and the same thing's true about the country. I just think it's some humility that we need there. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And when you, when you travel the world, you, you tend to hear some of the maybe negative impact that America mm-hmm. has had that, that we don't really see, or, or even the whole idea of like, when we think about like economic success in america when the economy is booming and, and there's wealth pouring into america we're like that's awesome that look at god's blessing us it's like but is that having a positive or a neg- negative impact on right, other right. nations and, and i don't know maybe it's a both and i don't know but i mean at least let's i just i constantly just want christians as members of christ's global multi-ethnic yeah. kingdom spread among the nations to constantly have a more global uh, mm-hmm. lens uh through all the all the political questions we wrestle with yeah, because the last time I checked, uh, not only do I have 340 or 330 million neighbors here in the confines of the United States of America, but in actuality, I should look at every single person on the planet as my neighbor to one extent or another yeah. and and care about them, not just the good of the, the U.S. of A. Let me, yeah. let me I want to yeah. jump forward in this part. Uh, I, I love this. This was really <clears throat> profound when I ran into this part where, again, we're talking to Preston Sprinkle, exiles the church in the shadow of empire. Many Christians talk about our country, our troops, our borders, and so on. I used to talk like this. This is Preston speaking, obviously. But as I kept reading the New Testament, something began to leap off the pages. Now, we're just going to make all kinds of people uncomfortable here, Preston. Yeah, but that's like I love, my yeah. spiritual <laughs> gift. <clears throat> uh, the first Christians rarely, if ever, use the pronouns. We're talking about pronouns. We, <laughs> us, or are to refer to the relationship with the Roman Empire, even if they were Roman citizens like Paul. It's almost comical to think of Paul referring to the Roman military as our troops or to the borders of the empire. It's our borders. That's so true. That's so true. <laughs> even Roman emperors were never referred to as our king or our leader. They were rulers of a different kingdom, as Paul said in 1 Timothy. Uh, I urge the, that petitions, prayers, and intercessions be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, uh, of course, so that we can live a quiet and peaceful life. Uh, Paul didn't tell Timothy to pray for our leaders. He told him to pray for Rome's leaders. Christians don't pray for our leader. We pray to our leader uh, to pray for our leader. We pray to our leader, which would be the Lord Jesus Christ. So I, this is mm-hmm. fascinating because I'm like, we got to get our border thing fixed. 
And I think this is a very important point that, that, okay, if it's our border, then is your first allegiance to America mm. or is your first allegiance to the kingdom of God? I love the, the subtle yet profound change in my own thinking when I say uh, the country instead of my country. Yeah. Although factually it's true. This is where I live. I'm a citizen yeah. of America, but in my thinking and in my theology, yeah. uh, I think it's helpful because we, most of us struggle with this. Yeah. I really love that. Uh, it's not our border. It's America's border. Talk, yeah. talk about that because that's, yeah. I think it's a really profound thing for people to <clears throat> wrestle with. I think when, when P yeah, it, it's, the whole plural pronoun thing. I know lots of debates about pronouns these days. And, and uh, <laughs> um, I, yeah, it's such a subtle shift, but I, over the last couple of years, really, I've tried to only use the plural pronoun when I'm talking about political issues to refer to my membership in Christ's global kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, we, our, us, it's, and this isn't us versus them, like us right. against the world. But the best way I can reach the world is to have both feet firmly planted in God's kingdom. Um, and, and it doesn't matter. I mean, sorry, it, it, it doesn't mean like the thing is going on at America's border doesn't matter. I, th I think, yeah, I think if in as much as we have opportunity, we can pursue uh, justice. Um, we can pursue goodness, uh, whatever that might look like. But it still is as a citizen of God's kingdom scattered among right. various nations. Some of us have been scattered among Mexico, some of us scattered among the United States of America. We, we have our, our, our family is on both sides of this border crisis. And that's mm -hmm. how I think we should view it. So it just kind of tweaks. Like when, when you, when you reserve the plural pronoun for our membership in Christ global kingdom, it just kind of tweaks every single question you yeah. consider. It just tweaks it a little bit so that you don't kind of slip into an unhealthy allegiance to whatever country uh, you might be living in. So, right. um, yeah, it's I it's it's I mean e even though I wrote that section and I've tried to do it, I I constantly catch myself saying our mm -hmm. this we this you know mm -hmm. um, we are supporting Israel you know we are supporting Ukraine or whatever and it's just like I just I just think that can lead it's a sub, it's just a subtle linguistic yeah. step yeah. toward I think unhealthy allegiance so. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm curious how that section's gonna land with people. When I was writing it, I'm like, this, this makes so much sense to me, but ooh, this is this is gonna. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if this is gonna land with everybody. <laughs> well, listen, but, yeah. I mean that, that that's what that's, happens when you start messing around. You know, now, I, I I have no problem saying what I'm about to say. I said it all the yeah. time in the air. Uh, you're you're gonna get a lot of crapola when you start messing with people's idols. And, and whether that, and, and especially if they don't think it's an idol and you infer mm -hmm. that it's an idol, they're going to be deeply offended. So whether it's Donald Trump or the United States of America, the Republican party, whatever, pick your idol, mm -hmm. uh, that, that's that people start getting really bent by that. But again, I think one of the great things about this and people are already probably not agreeing with some of the things you and I are saying, mm -hmm. uh, and you and I aren't going to have a hundred percent agreement sure. yet. We're brothers in Christ and I love you and you're stuck with me forever. So get over it. Uh, <laughs> But, but we should at least be wrestling with this, yes. like force the conversation and wrestle with it. That's why I, I agree. It's a subtle yet profound little shift to go. This is ultimately yeah. theologically, this is not my country. It's the country God has me in. I care about yeah. the country, but my, my kingdom is a different kingdom. Yeah. I don't think we can say that enough. Again, if we talk to our Nigerian brothers and sisters and they said, you know what, I, I don't know if I want to call Nigeria my country like it's I belong to if anybody if any other Christian in any other nation said what I, you know, I said in that little section there, I don't mm -hmm. think we'd have a problem with it. It's just when it comes to again, I think there is this kind of American exceptionalism that's just deep into our bones that we think our situation is just vastly different. And just to be so I love what you said, like my, my goal in this book, just to be super clear. You know, the book is 85% just Bible. Like it's just, I mean, right. Just look at it. Past. And I don't think I t take in most cases, I don't take really unique or fringe interpretations. I mean, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. just drawing on what basic biblical scholarship says it's when it, when you start applying it to, okay, the, so, so what does this mean now is when it gets a right. little dicey, you know, but so even that section, when I talk about the plural pronoun, the whole chapter is about uh, Philippians and how mm -hmm. Paul, in in the heart of that letter in, in 127, he uses a really unique word that's rarely translated correctly, uh, polythuamai or something like that. It, it, the, the root word has to do with the city or citizenship. 
And so he says, live out your citizenship in a manner worthy of Christ. Mm. And then he spends the next two chapters in this one long literary unit with Philippians 2 at the heart of it with the humiliation of Christ. And it's through his humiliation that he gets exalted. And then Epaphroditus does the same thing. And Timothy does the same thing. And it climaxes in 320 to 21, where he says, your citizenship, same word, only the noun here, is in heaven. So you have this beautiful, one of the most beautiful sections in all Paul's yep. letters oh, yeah. framed with this Paul challenging the Philippians on a proper view of citizenship. And it just so happens that Philippi was a Roman colony where a lot of ex-Roman military leaders were settled and they were granted citizenship. So most of the people he's writing to had the prized possession of Roman citizenship. So mm-hmm. all that, this, I mean, you and, and the reader can be the judge whether I'm teasing, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing an application correctly from that exegesis, but right. at least, at least. Then do your own, go back to Philippians and draw your own conclusion. Cause I, I, th- I think what I'm saying there is at least within the purview yeah. of how Paul might say something today. So, yeah. Well, uh, n- neither one of us is advocating uh, uh, hatred of America or even disinterest or disengagement, yeah. which we'll talk about. But, hmm. but, but just this constant reminder that uh, I am not of this world. I'm an alien, I'm a stranger. Mm-hmm. If you, by the way, if you never feel like an alien or you never feel like a stranger or you mm. never feel hated for your allegiance to Christ, you're probably doing it wrong. Not that you go out there and yeah. create hatred in order yeah. to validate the fact that you're a Christian, which I kind of used to do. Uh, <laughs> but, but you should never really feel all that comfortable being here. I thought this was fascinating uh, looking at this at the chapter, The Apocalypse of Empire. Yeah. One of the more daring claims in Revelation is that the Roman government and other Babylons that were the same, uh, that wear the same cap are empowered by Satan. (laughs) This claim must play a significant role in the church's political theology. Uh, I think of most of my friends and most of my listeners and, and people that I've been around for years, Preston would be like, well, uh, I think, the Democrat party is empowered by Satan, <laughs> but I don't think America largely is empowered by Satan. So help us understand the theology of that because yeah. that that's very important. And again, I think we tend to section off America mm-hmm. and all the other countries. Hey, is, is China empowered by Satan? Well, pff, yeah. Duh. What about yeah. Russia? Yeah. Duh. I mean, I, I, Putin's yeah. a pawn of Satan, a chew toy of Satan. What, what about North Korea? Oh yeah. That's a no brainer. The democratic Republic of Congo. Right. Democratic. That's funny. Yeah. All that stuff. They're empowered by Satan. But America, no, this is the this yeah. is the land of the, the good and the proud and the brave. And God yeah. established this nation. And so we're different. Yeah, that's good, man. I, I um again, that book, on the chapter on Revelation, which is according to virtually every scholar on Revelation, every scholar who is well versed in first century apocalyptic mm-hmm. literature, of which Revelation is one of several books written in that genre. They're, they're, they say this is one of the most politically charged books in ancient history. I mean, this, this, you know, they say the gloves come off in Revelation where you just unveil. I mean, it's apocalypse. It's an unveiling <laughs> right. yeah. of the political realities of the first century with an eye to the future. It's not just a roadmap, roadmap to the future. Uh, it does talk about the future. I mean, especially towards the end of the book, but it is primarily an unveiling of the political realities of the day. And, and there's, there's, again, this is not even dis. I guess everything can be disputed, but I mean, uh, uh, virtually right, yeah. every no, scholar, it's, it's not, yeah. I mean, Revelation 12 and 13 says the beast and the dragon are at one. The dragon is giving power to the beast and the beast is clearly, according to ver- chapter 17, 18 is uh, Rome, which is called Babylon. Now, one thing that the author does in chapter 13 is he... <clears throat> I don't get too lost in the weeds of the act of Jesus, but he, 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 he talks about the Roman empire as Babylon. Um, but also describe like uses Babylon is almost like a term, not just for ancient Babylon, not just for the Roman empire, mm-hmm. but any kind of yeah, Babylon like Roman like nation that is acting like an empire. Now, when you read the critique of the Roman empire throughout revelation, he critiques them for being very militaristic um indulging in luxury and wealth and being filled with sexual immorality well i mean i i, I don't want to say he's familiar. directly as described <laughs> if there was a nation today that came closest to that description i think there's a few but, I, but america is certainly 
we are the, the most militaristic, powerful, you know, uh, yep. nation where we are the wealthiest and um, we're filled with sexual immorality, you know? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I at least, nobody I, can doubt that. Yeah. I at least want Christians to read Revelation's description of Babylon and at least say, is there some caution uh, yeah. we should at least walk away with in yeah. terms of how we view maybe through rose colored glasses, the United States of America. Again, I am not, we submit to our government, governing authorities. We seek to go to the city. We pray for our leaders, but I think we should also have maybe a bit more of what I would call theological or biblical suspicion of mm -hmm. the, the nation that we're living under. It doesn't mean, like you said, we, we hate it. it uh, and doesn't mean everything they do is bad, but it means we should have this kind of just keep our theological distance a little yeah. bit from being too, you know, entangled with, with the empire today. Yeah. You gotta, I think you have to check your own heart. Don't be like the guy in James that looks in the mirror and, a couple minutes later, forgets what he looks like. I think we all have to wrestle with, am I, am I to the point in my political life that there's some Id idolatry in there? Do I hold America up uh, uh, to God's standard relative to the standard of other nations? One of the things that I do, which is very graphic and disgusting, but it, it makes the point is I'll remind, and I'll ask my students, I used to do this on the radio all the time. And you might remember this, Preston, Trump was at a CPAC convention this was uh, while he was the president and he comes out, there's this huge row of flags and he goes up to one of the flags and hugs it. Does that sound familiar? I, I didn't see a it, bunch of pictures yeah. of it. Okay, yeah. He yeah. goes up and he hugs the flag and he's got that cheesy face. And, and <laughs> I think at one point he even kisses the flag. And I, and I tell my students, listen, if I were there and I had the opportunity, I would sit and, and he's walking over to the flag. I would say, excuse me, Mr. President, uh, are you going to hug the flag? Uh, yes, I love America. I love the flag. Okay, can you can you all in a second just just give me a minute, just indulge me for a minute. I'll take that one flag. I'll take it off the stand. Uh, I'll drive to the nearest abortion clinic. I'll go behind the clinic. I'll open up a fifty five gallon drum. I'll dip the entire flag in the remains of babies, <laughs> and then I'll bring it back and I'll stick it on the flag. Uh, I'll put the pole in the stand and I'll say, "Hug it now." Mm. And, and nobody in their right mind can do that. And, and I'm like, do you guys know why I'm telling this rather disgusting story, this illustration? Because you have to, before you hug that flag, you have to deal with the fact that America has presided over the abortion of 62 million children, amongst yeah. other things. Yeah. My daughter used to, our 26-year-old who lives in New York City, uh, she used to get all over me when I would say, Indians, because Columbus was wrong. They weren't Indians in the first place. She wanted me to go with indigenous people. I've landed at Native Americans and take it up with uh, some people from Italy in terms of naming the whole place the Americas. Uh, but what we, what we did to most of the Native Americans, not all of them, some of those tribes were brutal, yeah. uh, just like Incas and my. So you have to understand the reality of it all. But before you throw on your MAGA hat or wrap yourself in the flag, you have to be sober minded about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and remember, just like you and just like me, there's there's some good things on this side, but there's plenty of blood on the ledger of America, which is why I think you really need to check your allegiance, which I wanted to ask you. This is a really long winded way of getting to it. <laughs> But I, but, and I really appreciate Preston that you, that you shared so many things that you did uh, personal to your own perspective and how you operate in the political mm -hmm. realm as a Christian living in America. But let's talk about the Pledge of Allegiance mm -hmm. for a minute, because uh, I'm about where you're at. I, at this okay. point in my life as a 58 year old, I got saved at 28. I'm, I'm well-schooled. I've been down a lot of roads as a Christian. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm really getting increasingly more uncomfortable with putting my hand on my heart and pledging allegiance to the flag yeah. of the United States. I talk about it in class and I know yeah. it makes people uncomfortable, but talk about that journey for you because yeah. I haven't, I think done it's it. important. Yeah. I haven't done it in years. Um, and there there's, I mean, there, there's branches of the church where this is just, this is not a big <laughs> deal. I mean, they, like the Anabaptists, the yeah. Mennonites, you know, and, and I, I, right. I, I wasn't raised Anabaptist, but my Go theology. Go hang out with the Amish. They don't have an issue with it. Yeah. That, that, well, I, um, I would say my theology is very close to like an, my, my Anabaptist friends say, you're Anabaptist. I'm like, well, I've never actually been to an Anabaptist church, but, but theologically, <laughs> I think I, I, I'm pretty close to where you guys are yeah. at. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I would, I would again, I'm going to take every political question and, and situate it in terms of Christ's global kingdom. Um, should members of Christ's global kingdom pledge allegiance to whatever country they've been scattered among? 
And I think when people ask, well, I don't know, it kind of depends, you know, and then we're going to get back into kind of like our nation's the best, you know, whatever. But um, I, so my, has my, the reason why I stopped doing it is because um, allegiance, the very idea of allegiance, even the gesture of hand over your heart mm-hmm. is that, that, that feels fairly religious to me. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. um, it is, it is, I mean, f- allegiance is kind of religious language yeah. and even the it's liturgical nature of pledging it i mean i could in my sleep recite it but i can't recite the 10 commandments or the nicene creed or the apostles creed you know it's like right. Right. I, I i'm like well that that i think can't we all admit that that might be problematic that mm-hmm. most christians could easily recite their elite a creed given their allegiance to a certain country that yeah. again it has a babylon sent to it and yet can't even remember the 10 commandments or recite the apostles creed. So I, um, and I just biblically, I just can't, I can't picture any mm-hmm. early Christian pledging allegiance to the, to Rome. And it's not, it's not a situation different back then and all. I'm, I'm not saying they're exactly the same, but there's still enough parallels that that was the empire that early Christians were scattered among yeah. and they were good citizens um, all throughout the book of Acts. They never actually broke a Roman law and yet wherever they went, they stirred up. Yeah. <laughs> they, right. They, they interrupted the fabric of the Roman way of doing things, right. but they never, they were good citizens. They never, never actually did something illegal. So we need to be good citizens. Um, we need to submit to government authorities, but get pledging allegiance to me is just, it's just taking a, a step too far. So I stand during the pledge of allegiance. I put my hands behind my back and I recite the Lord's prayer. And so, and people, so I, I would, I would love how often do people, how often do people call you out on that? Um, I, I, ha, I, I've been, I've, I've, it's come close. In fact, there was one setting where I was at a high school basketball game and there were Christians behind me that were noticing other people weren't standing and they were furious, Yeah, yeah. but they happened to not, I was kind of, they were looking over to my right and I was over to the left and I was like, Oh man, if they see, but I was standing, you know, I, again, I, I stand mm-hmm. because I want to, I want to honor, yeah. I want to give honor to, yeah, the I have emperor. no problem with the word honor. Yeah. 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 First Peter two right there. I you know, honor the emperor. Um, so I want to give honor, but hand over the heart reciting the pledge to me is giving, it's more than just honor. That's giving allegiance that I just can't like, I, I don't believe the words that I'm saying, so I, I'm not going to recite yeah. it. So, um, yeah, I, I, here's, here's, so here, if people are like, Oh, I, I still am not on board. I think we should pledge it. I would say at least come up with a a thoughtful theological argument for yes. pledging allegiance. Don't just do it because that's what we've always done and Christians should do this. Right. Why? Right. Just because they should. And, you know, at least have a good theological argument why you should uh, pledge allegiance. So, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, and again, I think one of the greatest things about this book, and again, we're talking to Preston Sprinkle, the author of Exiles, the Church in the Shadow of Empire. It's just as to go, and you just made the noise, and I've made it too. You go, hmm. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I hadn't really thought of that. Well, you should. Mm. And, and we should be much more introspective about our faith, and especially when it comes to our faith, our allegiance to Christ versus our allegiance to America and the Pledge of Allegiance and the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and all those things. And, and just to go, okay, <clears throat> I, I can't judge your heart. I can't judge another person's heart. Uh, but but you should at least wrestle with it because I think we're definitely in a place where a lot of Christians that love the Lord uh, perhaps love America in a way that they can't back up theologically and might actually be uh, harmful to their own witness and perhaps just the witness of the church at large. And so that's one of the things I love about this book, Exiles, is it just forces you, it should, you should be willing to be questioned mm-hmm. and to ask these types of questions and, and to wrestle with it. I wanted to talk real quick before we run out of time. Uh, just talk briefly, uh, Preston, and, and others have written on this. I think this is a very important thing. Three approaches to church and state, detachment, transformation, mm-hmm. and a prophetic witness. So just touch on those quickly. And then I want to talk about uh does in fact Christ reign in November and then we'll finish up. But, but like, how do we engage? We're talking about the challenges of, are we going too far with our allegiance and things of that nature? But uh, yeah. wh- what should our approach be on the positive side? Should we detach ourselves? Should we move to Pennsylvania? Uh, should we all, all be about transformation, which starts to sound a little bit like the social gospel mm-hmm. or, or what is a prophetic witness? So just real quick on those. Yeah. Yeah. So the yeah, detachment is kind of like what you said, you know, we think of like an Amish community where you just kind of remove yourself as Christian communes and just completely separate from society. 
um, transformation is kind of the opposite. Like, no, we should transform society. We should transform politics. We should uh, put Christians in political positions of political power and, and, and really invest our energy in, in, in making America great again. I mean, well, that's, you know, um, it, it's a bipartisan transformation too. I, I think. I mean, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, where, you know, but maybe more progressive minded Christian would say, no, we need to, you know, we're, we're not for Trump or anti-Trump. And so Biden is our mes- Messiah because he's going to fight against Trump. And I, to me, I, I see both hyper Trumpism sure. and anti- anti-Trumpism but is just both problematic, really. <laughs> Trump derangement syndrome <laughs> yes. exists on both sides of the aisle. <laughs> Thank you for that. That phrase, I, 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 I think that's, I have friends that have Trump derangement syndrome. I'm like, you know, you're being fed all that stuff by the other side of the empire. You know that <laughs> Democrats are just using all anything they can I mean, Democrats are th- of thrilled about January 6th. I, they, th- they thrilled Thrill. about it. Oh, now they have fodder to say, do you want this dictate? Look at all, you know, and like, they don't care. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, don't, they don't care about you. They want your vote and your money. So <laughs> um, yep. anyway, so I, um, yeah, so transformation. We, we need to like transform society. I, and so the, the, the approach I take is what I call prophetic. No, it's not me. I, other people have called it this kind of prophetic sure. witness where the church kind of does speak truth to power, pursues justice, but it doesn't get it's 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 suspicious about the sort of um, getting too wrapped up in the power politics of of the day. So, you know, there's debates about whether MLK and the civil rights movement is that transformation or is it prophetic witness? You know, um, I, I could I could see it through bo- both ways. In a sense, he yeah, did transform. Both- he did sure. transform. What he saw is what you know we all see now is unjust laws, segregation, and so on. Um, but you know he did he he did so through nonpartisan Christian means. He he did so nonviolently, and and when he was arrested, he said, "Okay, I'm going to submit to the empire." And you know, mm-hmm. so I I, um, I think I I tend to think he's he might be more of a prophetic witness than than well, maybe he kind of sits somewhere in between. So anyway, I just yeah, argue I that I, so. I think I think taking a more prophetic witness posture takes the good of transformation, takes the good of uh, iso- uh, the detachment, you know, detachment that we want to detach because we want to maintain the purity of the church. I'm like, well, that's a good thing to do. You know, right, sure. um, transformation, you know, we want to produce good in the society. I'm like, Oh, I think that's good too. I just see it maybe getting a little bit too wrapped up in, 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 in the empire sometimes and how it goes about it. So I, I'll, no, I'll I be, think there's that. I, I was just no, saying this, ahead, this chapter is, is one where I'm, tr- I'm trying to explore broader questions where I, I i think i make it clear like i'm I'm just i'm teasing stuff out here i'm, I'm not mm-hmm. once once i get outside of just raw exegesis of the bible i'm, I'm now getting outside of my lane you know so um, right, right. i would i would love for christians to kind of consider those three lenses and 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 see which one's most faithful to scripture so yeah i think i think the weight of this topic uh we have to get it, we have to give it rightful consideration. And you keep using the word consider, which I appreciate. And, and that's what the book is here for. <laughs> Preston writes Exiles, the Church in the Shadow of Empire for my consideration, for your consideration. And you should consider it. You should consider you want to get in the right position with respect to your allegiance to the actual kingdom of God versus your allegiance to in your life in the United States of America. And you have to be, and, and as the America becomes increasingly more anti-Christian and negative, it's a negative world where for the first time in American history, really a, a, a large portion of Americans view Christianity, not from a neutral perspective, but from a negative perspective, it's harmful. We have to deal with it. It's, I, I can't imagine what it's going to be like for your kids and my kids, Preston. Uh, but, but for your consideration, you should consider this. You should be willing to throw yourself in the spotlight and consider what you're doing with your political view of yourself in, in this country. Let's finish with this because Super Tuesday's over. That was a big day here in, in North Carolina. Uh, I, 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 I have no bones uh, telling everybody who they should vote for. I do it every two years and I just share that. And, and, and I'm, I spent 10 years in Chicago, so it's my ode to Chicago. I literally vote hundreds and hundreds of times every two years by using the platform God's allowed me to have. But this is important and we'll finish with this. We can therefore have a kind of theological confidence 
no matter who Babylon decides its next leader will be, yeah. the leader of Babylon is still leading Babylon, which is why you have to understand what Babylon is. And the leader of God's kingdom hasn't changed. Mm. I think it's natural to have an opinion about what Babylonian leader might be better at ruling Babylon, but our opinion on the matter should be as exiles, not as Babylonians. And again, uh, I'm like, listen, God knows when I voted for Trump and I'm not in there going, hey, I'm a full throat endorsement of this guy and everything he does and everything he's been, blah, 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 blah. And when you're dealing with elections, Preston, you're always choosing the lesser of two evils because you're always working with human beings. Uh, there's only one perfect candidate. He's already the king of the universe and he doesn't need your vote. <laughs> and so I do the best. I'm very pragmatic. Yeah. I don't think that's a sin. I do the best that I can. But I think it's a good reminder in November, we have these two old white guys <laughs> in a country that complains about old white people. Pretty yeah. funny. <clears throat> and, and even if Trump loses and Biden wins, or if Trump wins and Biden loses, on, on the grand scheme of God's sovereignty and his plan for the world, that really is hardly a blip on the radar screen. And I think yeah. it's important for us to remember that. So just speak to that real quick as we finish up and any encouragement you want to, you want to throw at people that are, are my, I am my audience. I'm 58. I'm uber conservative, theologically, politically. Yeah. I'm so far to the right. I'm about to fall off the flat earth, but, <laughs> but God has done some remarkable things in my mind and in my heart with respect to this subject. So definitely encouragement, but yeah. just about November and encouragement in general, and then we'll finish. I, I love, I love your posture in that, you know, yeah. But you know, I, I'm not against uh, voting. I'm not against not voting. Um, I, I'm just, you know, want Christians to be cautious of giving their allegiance to a political party and, and the, the political parties are wooing you in. They are spending mm -hmm. tons of money, literally billions of dollars, to gain your allegiance. Um, they, you know, um, so yeah, I, you know, m maybe I, I, I consider elections I, again, kind of like how the Jewish exiles might've considered transition and leadership. Like when Nabonidus became the leader of Babylon and uh, over Nebuchadnezzar, like how would the exiles have felt about that? I'm sure they might've had an opinion. Like, you know, what? I think Neb Nabonidus sure. is going to do a better job running, uh, Babylon, the, the Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar kind of, you know, he destroyed our temple and killed a bunch of people. And is not a as much better. I don't know, maybe, maybe, you know, and then Cyrus comes on the scene and takes over. And well, Cyrus is probably clearly better at running the Persian Empire than Nabonidus clearly. was at Babylon. But even the, the manner in which I'm talking, it still is like that. That's it's still the, the nation that I'm scattered among, not my primary identity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is you know, yeah, we, we've got two old white guys. One's got dementia and the other one's a, probably a clinical narcissist who believes in his own lies and is <laughs> not really moral. And I don't, I don't, I honestly don't know. I, I, I think, yeah, I, I honestly don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to say anything who I think in my heart. I, no, think, but, I think they're both but, two sides of the empire and, and sure. with one, yeah, you're going to get some good things and some bad things. And yeah. Yeah. So I, I, ori I originally titled that section, you know, it's now titled Christ reigns in November. My original mm, yeah. title was uh, Yawn in November. And I, thought, I felt like that was a little too strong. Some people, because I think the, <laughs> the good pushback was, well, you live over there in Idaho with your privilege and all this stuff. And, you know, <laughs> what do you care? Like, it doesn't affect you who's in office, but it affects a lot of other people if the wrong guy gets in. I'm like, well, right. yeah. I'm, I'm not yeah. sure I agree with that, but that's, I, I don't want to be too flippant around mm -hmm. political changes, but I also don't want to be too invested either. Um, Right. We're going right. to wake up the next day after November, whatever second. And, and Christ is still going to be on, on the throne and our mission as part That's of right. a glob, Christ's global kingdom has not changed at all. And That's right. if, if Trump gets, you know, if Trump gets elected, it's not like Satan's going to be there saying, no, oh no, what am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, or, th or vice versa. You next know, it's to like <laughs> Jesus coming back. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> Yeah, right. That's so, not going to happen. I like your perspective. I think that's that's healthy. Yeah, and I think that's uh, again, uh, reading this book is for your consideration. Yeah, and I think you need to consider it because I think a lot of us struggle with this, and we got to get our identity right uh, because this country is going to increasingly go negative against us. And then you're like, well, how how now shall we live? Mm. That's the question uh, in whatever context. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's why I think it's such an important book. Exiles, the Church in the Shadow of Empire. Uh, can't recommend it enough. A great thought exercise, exegetical. And, and 
we should all wrestle with this particular subject. So Preston, God bless you for writing this and thanks for doing it. And thanks for the conversation today. It's just been great. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. You're welcome.